Good morning. While well, people are trickling in into the room, let me start. My name is Chantal de jonge uh, And for those of you who were not there yesterday, I'm the Executive Director of CIPRI North America. Uh, on behalf of my co-organizers, USIP, PRIO, the Human Rights Center at the University of California, Be Berkeley, welcome. Uh, I think we had a very interesting day yesterday. Uh, I also would like to remind you that um, we had the posters of the Young Scholars up on the side of the Leland Terrace, and I would really urge you to have a look at those posters. There's some very path-breaking research that these Young Scholars are doing. I also would like to invite you to visit the Hive, the knowledge platform of the World Bank. Again, this is a very innovative uh, platform that uses uh, modern technology uh, and is a way for us to keep connected and be on top of the latest research and information. In terms of, of yesterday, as I said, I thought it was a very interesting day. Uh, we touched upon a lot of issues, including the importance of thinking and working across sectors and disciplines. Uh, we talked about how sexual violence is often a symptom of deeper structural problems within societies, problems that also have to do with the distribution of resources and power. We talked about the role and tasks and actions of international actors. And the World Bank is, of course, an extremely important actor in this regard. And that is the reason why we're so delighted with the sponsor and partnership of the bank. I'm very honored to introduce our keynote speaker for today, the Vice President and Head of the Poverty Reduction and Economic Management Network, Mr. Ottaviano Canuto. Mr. Canuto joined the bank in 2009 and supervises a group of over 700 economists and public sector specialists. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> he provides strategic leadership and direction on economic policy formation in the area of growth, poverty, debt, trade, public sector management, governance, and gender. Prior to his position at the bank, uh, Mr. Canuto has also served in the Brazilian Ministry of Finance, where he was Secretary for International Affairs and was also an academic. He was a professor at the University of Sao Paulo and the University of Campinas in Brazil. Mr. Canuto, we are absolutely delighted to have you here with us today. Uh, we would like to thank you for the bank's support, not just for this symposium, uh, but also for your longer term and enduring support for gender equality. Uh, on a more personal note, I would also like to uh, thank and recognize your colleague, Pia Peters, who has been absolutely terrific. Uh, she's not only passionate about this, but as we said, an extreme professional. So thank you very much. Well, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you all very much for the opportunity to participate in this symposium. Uh, and my special thanks go to, uh, particularly to the co-organizers of this event. And uh, because it is an honor for the World Bank to be part of uh, such an initiative as it brings together researchers, policymakers, and practitioners from all over the world to better understand the cause of sexual violence and its implications for societies at large. And uh, we have increasingly realized at the bank, and that's why the, uh, the gender equality and development thematic is uh, under my, um, the, my umbrella as a VP, is because we have increasingly realized the, the, uh, the importance of uh, gender equality, not only as an end in itself, but also for its economic uh, implications, the connections between economics and gender equality. And that may help because uh, certainly if we can convince ministers of finance about the relevance of uh, 
of, of gender equality, that will help uh, the cause. That's the, the basic rationale for having gender equality and development as part of the, uh, the, the mandate of my vice presidency. Now, uh, uh, I will try to bring uh, some of our uh, point of view. And uh, as Chantal has aptly said, we have in Pia one of our, uh, besides her own qualities as, as, a, as a professional and as a world banker, uh, institutions like ours need to have some champions, those people who can conciliate uh, professional capacity with passion and uh, because they, they move things around. And I think uh, we all thank for all of us working with gender and development of the bank are thankful to Pia uh, for exactly her combination of passion and, 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 and competence. Now, of course, going more specifically to our uh, subject focus uh, today, efforts to address more effectively sexual and gender-based violence in conflict and fragile states will contribute to promoting gender equality, uh, which is, as I said, has become one of the World Bank's corporate priorities, as highlighted, uh, among others, by uh, one of our recent World Development Report, the one on gender, uh, the, the WDR 2012, that addressed uh, the links between, between uh, uh, gender and development, and including that, uh, the, the connections with the issue of conflict. Uh, well, let me quote, uh, let me refer to our new boss, the President Jim King. He, uh, during our last annual meetings in Japan, uh, he emphasized quite clearly, that was his first address, uh, that the World Bank Group needs to move forward with uh, an ever greater sense of urgency in assisting fragile states. So we do have the fragile states and, and gender as two of the corporate priorities. I know that yesterday, and I heard from Chantal, you discussed the existing global frameworks uh, for addressing sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict, as well as the existing national frameworks for addressing sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict. Today, uh, I know as well, looking at the program, that you will examine quickly different explanations of the perpetration of sexual violence in armed conflict, as well as survivals of sexual and gender-based violence. And I know that you also, at the end, discuss, will discuss global responsibility to protect individuals from conflict-related sexual and gender-based violence in particular, and quickly discuss existing practice. Let me then here highlight three issues uh, which we believe would be important to, uh, to be present in your discussions uh, today and, and tomorrow. They are basically, the develop first, the development impacts of sexual and gender-based violence in conflict and fragile states are high. So there are development impacts that should be considered as also part of the question. Second, uh, it, it is the, the need for a multi-sectoral approach addressing sexual and gender-based violence. And I will uh, try to illustrate that uh, later. And third, the need to include both female and male gender issues when addressing sexual and gender-based violence and promoting gender equality. So let me briefly uh, give uh, a take in each, one, uh, in each one of these three uh, points. First, on the development impacts of sexual and gender-based violence in conflict in fragile states. Beyond the physical and psychological damage for the individuals involved, gender-based violence also carries important social and economic costs. The impact on economic growth and poverty reduction is substantial through the, uh, several channels. Uh, these costs are particularly high in countries in conflict or emerging out of conflict where sexual violence is rife and where it's used as a weapon 
of war, which caused deep trauma and undermined social cohesion. Often impunity reigns, as justice systems are too weak to prosecute perpetrators. High-level perpetrators are often party to peace agreements and the ensuing political pact. And a climate of fear impedes participation in economic, social, and political life. Survivors often face stigma and rejection by their spouse, families, and community. All this undermines trust within communities and between communities and the state, and that deeply affects social cohesion and thus inhibits peace building and development. And for several reasons, it, it's, it's known by now uh, uh, and acknowledged by uh, development economists, the relevance of uh, governance, the relevance of trust of social capital uh, in order to, to build to uh, conditions for accumulation of wealth and, and living poverty. So the relevance of uh, trust and social capital among the factors that lead to progress and so going out from poverty is a fundamental component. It's, it's part of the so-called intangible wealth uh, that is at the core of uh, the movement of countries from the situation of uh, uh, conflict and, and fragile state condition toward at least a low income state. So uh, the impacts of, uh, of sexual violence uh, and gender based violence go much beyond the, uh, the, the problem itself. So that's the important message, the economic relevance of having the, the appropriate dealing with the issue. Second point, as I uh, highlighted at the beginning, sexual violence is a complex problem that requires an integrated multi-sectoral response. Any effective response must combine enforcing laws and prosecuting perpetrators to break the cycle of impunity with addressing the individual and societal wounds while working to prevent a normalization in our recurrence of uh, sexual violence. Because another stylized fact that you know quite well is that sexual violence tends to remain high even uh, after a conflict ends, as, and this came out clearly as evidence uh, by uh, a global review that the bank conducted for the uh, uh, a previous World Development Report, the one uh, tw of 2011, on, on, on conflict. Uh, uh, in, in that survey covered 50 countries, and that came clear. It, sexual violence remains. It doesn't end abruptly simply because of, a, of some sort of announcement of, uh, of, of peace agreements. Uh, so, uh, what, what do you have in mind when you say multi-sectoral approach and, 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 and also coordinated approach? It, because response to sexual and gender-based violence need to address, among others, let's name a few of dimensions, health sector, obviously, including physical as well as mental health issues, but also the judicial sector, including addressing issues of impunity and access to justice, also for low-income population. Economic, uh, including economic empowerment of uh, survivors and of sexual and gender-based violence, uh, as well as improving the overall economic conditions in fragile states. Community development, promoting equitable access to resource for women and men. And Prevention of sexual and gender-based violence, for example, through formal and informal educations, as well as advocacy at the community, national, and international levels. And, of course, addressing the drivers of fragility and conflict to address ongoing conflicts and prevent future conflicts. So one needs a multi-sectoral, multi-tiered uh, uh, approach. Uh, it doesn't suffice to focus only on one of these dimensions. Third point that I made at the outset, addressing both female and male gender issues when addressing sexual and gender-based violence and promoting gender equality. 
uh, while the nature uh, and patterns of sexual and gender-based violence against women and girls in recent and ongoing conflicts are increasingly documented and uh, a wide variety of programs are assisting survivors, limited attention is given to the multiple roles that men and boys play in sexual and gender-based violence both during and after conflict. So including men in programs addressing gender-based violence is especially important for prevention. Maybe that has not been so clear uh, previously, but now more than ever, I have to keep this in mind. So uh, program interventions must uh, acknowledge men's multiple roles, not only as perpetrators, but also as witnesses to sexual and gender-based violence, as victims of sexual violence, as service providers, uh, health workers, police, peacekeepers, and other workers in demobilization initiatives, as decision makers and policy makers, and as change agents. We need to have more men uh, involved in the effort. Now, these are the three, let's say, uh, overall topics that we would bring to uh, as a suggestion for discussion. Let me just say a bit, it's part of my function, uh, a bit of show and tell about what the bank has been doing, right? That comes with my job description, of course. Uh, to date, the uh, most work on sexual violence that the bank has implemented has been conducted with support of trust funds, particularly the state and peace building fund and the learning on gender and conflict in Africa, Logica, uh, MDTF, uh, multi-donor trust fund, together with the Global Center on Conflict, Security and Development, which aims to serve as a global hub connecting those working in fragile and conflict-affected situations across the world. And, and the, the, the Global Center was established following the WDR uh, 2011 that was on, on, on conflict. Our support includes operational and analytical work in post-conflict and fragile states. And these, uh, those works address, among others, issues of prevention as well as support to survival of sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, some examples of operations related to sexual and gender-based violence in post-conflict and fragile states include the protection from uh, gender-based violence program in Côte d'Ivoire, which aims at preventing sexual violence against women and providing assistance to victims, but also uh, addressing sexual gender-based violence in South Kivu Project in DRC, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, but also in Haiti, the Rapid Social Response Project, Women and Girls in Haiti's Reconstruction, uh, and, and several research initiatives and technical assistance focusing on identifying cost-effective approach to address sexual and gender-based violence in fragile and complex states. Uh, we are, uh, let me highlight here, that we are supporting the development of uh, a manual on how to engage men in preventing and mitigating the consequences of gender-based violence in post-conflict sub-Saharan Africa, with field work in Burundi, DRC, and South Sudan. Our implementation partner for this initiative is Promundo, one of the sponsors of, uh, of this symposium. But let me highlight that we can also learn from our experience addressing gender-based violence and domestic violence through our ongoing work in non-conflict states. For example, strengthening institutional capacity building to promote and monitor laws addressing gender issues in Brazil. That has been a recent source of, uh, of knowledge on the ground uh, that should also be added to, to our limelight. Uh, support survives the service for survivals of sexual and gender-based violence in Honduras through a project developing urban municipalities. That's another example uh, of uh, a potential source of learning for all of us here. Or uh, the technical assistance that we have been providing to Solomon Islands uh, through a project. 
or the, 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 uh, the experience with promoting safer transport in urban areas in Bolivia uh, through an urban infrastructure project that has been working quite well. Uh, also, we have a, a good experience in Bangladesh through the support that we are providing to the development of a one-stop crisis center. In fact, several centers for violence against women in Bangladesh. So, you know, we have all over uh, the world potential for spots of learning. Many things are happening. And, uh, and these lessons, these paradigms can be brought and adapted uh, to the, the post-conflict uh, context, obviously. Uh, we have a forthcoming report at the bank uh, on voice agency and participation. My colleagues from the Brand Gender Anchor are uh, preparing it. And, uh, and sexual and gender-based violence will also be addressed in that report. Uh, so, in a nutshell, we are learning every day from these ongoing initiatives. Our ongoing experience also confirms the importance of multi-sector approaches to address sexual and gender-based violence, as I said. And as we increase our learning together with partners such as you, we will strengthen this and, and scale up our efforts to address gender-based violence. Both fragility and gender remain high on our agenda, including as priorities for our forthcoming discussions with our donors for the IDA 17, for the, replen the, the next round of replenishment of IDA. As the World Bank, we also look forward uh, continuing to support this initiative of the symposium, among others, through supporting a, a potential follow-up symposium. I wish you fruitful discussions today and tomorrow, and look forward to the results of this symposium. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for that uh, encouraging announcement for support of this uh, Missing Peace Symposium initiative. And we will look forward to working with the bank in preparing a follow-up symposium. Let me ask uh, Inger and Kim to uh, come up for the next panel. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is panel three, <coughs> focusing on perpetrating sexual violence. My name is Inger Sandstedt, uh, and um, I'm going to moderate this uh, panel this morning with my colleague from the Human Rights Center, Frederick Ludwig, Kim Schellinger, who heads the Sexual Violence and Accountability Project there. I had originally planned to introduce this panel as this is the panel where we will discuss the elephant in the room. But I realized that after the discussions yesterday that the elephant was seen and named many times. <laughs> so my introduction doesn't work anymore. But I think that is only fitting uh, for where we are on the research front. I'm a researcher myself on this theme. Uh, and I've worked on gender and conflict issues and sexual violence issues since uh, the mid-1990s, and it's interesting to observe the changes that have taken place, where from the beginning, trying to just getting recognition that there are different experiences in war, to documenting what these differences are, sexual violence in particular, and then starting to ask questions about the perpetrators, who are they? And I think that we should go into this discussion remembering that perpetrators are not born perpetrators, they become perpetrators, changes in their lives. 
And I think that unpacking those changes is what we, or those processes, is what we can discuss at this panel here today. Uh, the panel will examine the variation in nature and degree of sexual violence across armed groups, regions, and conflicts, how society's gender constructions figure into the perpetration of sexual violence and conflict, and the complex relationship between perpetration and victimhood. Uh, I will briefly introduce the panelists. We have Maria Eriksson Boss of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. We have Hassan Billeti of the Global Justice and Research Center in Liberia. We have Dara K. Cohen from Harvard University. Laura Schoberg from the University of Florida. Martina Ruth Lerschner of the University of Konstanz and the organization Vivo. And Elizabeth Wood of Yale University. And we have agreed that each panelist will get to say two sentences, maybe three, uh, about <laughs> their work, and then one sentence which uh, will say something about the most surprising things that they have uncovered on this theme in their work. Martina. Maria. Maria. Yeah, Maria. Martina, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, two sentences. Uh, just uh, to say shortly, this is a project that I've been working on together with Maria Stern. Please, unfortunately, couldn't be here. Uh, and it's focused on the Congolese State Armed Forces, which when we started was the biggest perpetrator of sexual violence in the Congo. Uh, and it was a project mainly based on interviews with soldiers and officers in the armed forces. And I would say that this was very surprising research. We had to rethink most of our preconceptions. Uh, one of it being that it was used mainly strategically, and it was not. But also, I think another point we have to focus on here is is the danger of isolating sexual violence from other violence committed and the need to actually situate it in relation to other violence in order to understand the dynamics behind it. Thank you. And you were short. Thank you for that too. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I work with the Global Justice and Research uh, Center project in Monrovia. Basically what we do is we document war-related crimes that includes uh, uh, killings and uh, sexual violence against men and women during conflict in Liberia. And our goal is that in the future, at some point, as long as we have those documents, we can go after some of those people even after 10, 20, 30 years at some point. And I would say what is surprising to us is that of late, the hundreds of people we've spoken with, some of them victims of uh, sexual violence, we have begun to see a trend in the direction of people wanting prosecution in Liberia. That's quite surprising because the uh, general opinion was, well, the people want, let bygone be bygone, let's forget it and move on. But many people are beginning to realize that without justice, you cannot really build a formidable democratic society. And that has quite surprised to us. Thank you. Dara. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my research looks at the causes of wartime rape, um, and more specifically, uh, the puzzle of why, even within the context of the same war, some armed groups commit uh, wartime rape and others don't. Um, I'm a political scientist, and I combine both qualitative and quantitative methods. So in the quantitative method realm, I've collected uh, cross-national data, kind of combing through public human rights reports to um, find all reports of wartime rape in recent conflicts. And in my qualitative work, I've done field work in three post-conflict countries where I've interviewed ex-combatants, victims, local academics, NGOs, um, about the experiences of violence in, in those places. Um, and I want to emphasize especially that I think um, to understand perpetration, interviews, surveys, speaking directly to perpetrators is really important. Um, not just extrapolating from victim statements, but actually talking to the perpetrators themselves to understand really why rape happens during wartime. Um, in terms of the most interesting thing that has come out of the research, I think, um, is that many perpetrators, many members of armed groups who perpetrate wartime rape are ordinary people. They're ordinary men and women. And there's something, um, I, I think there's, there's a kind of common finding in the research on perpetration of wartime rape that um, people who perpetrate rape during wartime are quite different from the kinds of people that perpetrate rape during peacetime. They're kind of more normal. 
they're less pathological. Um, and the argument that I present in my project is, is about um, the power of group pressures and um, what happens in, inside armed groups in terms of uh, group pressures. Um, and I'll just say briefly, briefly, I think the group pressure argument helps us understand two uh, puzzling features of wartime rape. The first is that um, gang rape appears more common and in some contexts much more common in, in wartime than it is in peacetime. And, I, and this, I think, is because um, we, we know from research that uh, gang rape can increase um, esteem amongst a, uh, the perpetrators, can in increase uh, social bonding. Um, and secondly, that I think the group pressure mechanism can help us understand why in some contexts we also see female perpetrators, that when women are um, also uh, members of armed groups, they're subjected to a lot of the same pressures um, and norms that men are. And so in those cases, we do sometimes see women perpetrators. Thanks. Thank you. Laura. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, the relevant part of my research to this is about a decade-long project now on women's involvement in political violence. Uh, it started with the project on terrorism and insurgency and kind of is built into a project on women perpetrators of sexual violence and more particularly genocidal rape. Um, in fact, my most recent book, which if I get it right is going to go to the publisher next week, um, is called Rape Among Women and it has five cases of women's perpetration of rape and genocide. Um, and uh, I think that uh, my research complements Dara's in a lot of ways, but it's very different in a lot of ways. I'm not all that interested in why women uh, perpetrate sexual violence or why sexual violence is perpetrated. I'm interested in kind of two different things. The first is how women's violence is signified differently than men's violence and what that means about gender particularly what it means about what gender subordination is. And then my kind of inner lawyer uh, is interested in, right, I know I should hide now. Um, my inner lawyer is interested in whether or not the sex of the perpetrator makes a difference in the prosecution and whether or not the sex of the perpetrator makes a difference in the things that a victim can expect to get uh, in terms of the treatment that victims, uh, the, the treatment that victims can expect to get, kind of post-conflict, both in terms of whether or not their perpetrators are prosecuted, but also in terms of victim recognition. Thank you. Continue. Yeah, we at Vivo have a long work uh, to understand, prevent, and remedy the impact of sexual violence, and to understand that. And today we have no doubt that the key is really to detailed analysis about acts of victimization and perpetration. So in the framework of our specially tailored trauma treatment, we go into the detail, we reconstruct in detail what actually happened during traumatic events and what led up to it. And we don't only do that work with victims, but also with perpetrators like you already stressed. And we see that in the projects we are running in DRC, in Burundi, in northern Uganda, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, among others, this not only helps the individual, the individual traumatized perpetrator or victim to psychologically <coughs> recover, but also the entire community. And it has also additional other favorable side effects, like there is more readiness to reconcile and there is refusal of ex-combatants to be re-recruited. So basically, in a nutshell, what we would say today is treating perpetrators in the good way of preventing further violence and it helps to break the cycle of violence. Elizabeth. Good morning. I've been analyzing, documenting the fact that many armed groups do not engage in high levels of sexual violence. Uh, and this is a very important fact about patterns of wartime sexual violence. It has implications not just for prevention because it suggests that if we study armed groups whose combatants do not engage in sexual violence, we can learn something about how armed groups make decisions, why they make decisions, and then how they uh, in effectively prohibit sexual violence. But it's also very important for prosecution because if we can demonstrate the fact that armed groups, should they choose to do so, can prevent wartime rape, 
then that gives us all the more reason to hold accountable those groups that fail to make that decision, fail to effectively prohibit wartime rape. So my work took, uh, to me, kind of unexpected turn as I uh, got um, more deeply into um, my uh, uh, research, which was uh, a decision to focus on armed groups that don't engage in high levels of rape. And I think that this is important because so much of the research um, and the policy work is engaged with groups that do. And I think that there are insights to be gained from looking at armed groups that don't. And, and I'll go on to talk some about that uh, a bit later. And the second uh, kind of surprising turn was that um, the field research that I do is with <coughs> combatants uh, rather than victims. As I began thinking about this project, I thought that um, at some point I would build on the expertise of many in the audience and um, perhaps do a survey uh, to complement in-depth oral histories um, with uh, displaced populations and so on. And I then took uh, decisions, I did, as did many of us on the panel, to instead um, work with combatants, and in particular combatants, that their experience of um, joining an armed group, being trained by an armed group, being indoctrinated, indoctrinated into that armed group, and then for some of them uh, leaving the armed group. So really trying to understand what that uh, experience is and why it leads in some cases to uh, mass perpetration and in other cases not. Um, uh, just to finish the most surprising uh, piece of this is uh, something that I kind of stumbled across early on, uh, which has then been much better documented in the work of members of the Young Scholars Network, which is a fantastic thing coming out of this uh, project, particularly the work of Derek Cohen, now extended in the project at Frio with Vantes Nordas. Uh, and this surprising fact is that many conflicts see an asymmetric pattern of rape by which I mean that one group uh, in that conflict engages in moderate high levels of rape, and other group or groups do not. And that pattern may be sustained over the entire length of the conflict. That's very puzzling because it suggests that society-wide um, notions of patriarchy or pre-war levels of rape can't explain what we're observing because that doesn't explain that asymmetry. Thank you. Thank you all for being brief. And I think just from this short introduction, we've covered many uh, different ways of approaching uh, or trying to understand perpetration of sexual violence from the individual therapy level to the social level, to group level, to the military dynamics in context with other kinds of violence, accountability issues, and so on. And now I have a few questions for each of you, so you get a chance to explore a little more what you already alluded to. So I'll start with you, Maria. Uh, you and Maria Stern, as you said, have written about the problem of focusing on sexual violence to the exclusion of the relationship between sexual violence and other types of violence, as you just said, in conflict. And note that violence is, to a large extent, a manifestation of systematic failures and mechanisms as those contributing to sexual violence. Does that mean that we should avoid focusing on sexual violence and focus instead on the factors that contribute to all types of violence? Uh, I would say absolutely not. <laughs> I just want to be clear on that. On, on that. Uh, so we're not saying we should stop focusing on sexual violence, but mainly that we need to be better at situating sexual violence in relation to other violence, understand the dynamics behind it. Uh, and I think we need to recognize that sexual violence in conflict has a gender logic and this is related both to the military institution and the culture of the military institution, militarized masculinity, etc. And of course also in relation to the norms of society, which is why sexual violence in war became such an effective tool of humiliation, etc. And we all know that in terms of the gender uh, dimensions. Uh, but there are also other dynamics behind, which became very clear in, in our research. And I, I think you know, one of the basic problems, I think, is that we had, tend to have a divide between, on the one hand, you have the gender and feminist studies, which tend to focus only on sexual violence and that dynamics. And on the other hand, you have other types of research, which is looking at 
and the violence in war more generally, uh, which do not attempt to sexual violence at all, or just mentions it, or sort of things that has just a similar logic. So I think this, this kind of, of divide which we need to bridge, and I think the work of Elizabeth, for example, is again very important here. Uh, but examples of these similar dynamics, I mean, there are several, but in our research, I would say the, the most important and most surprising for us was, uh, was the workings of military structures or military dysfunctions. Uh, the Congolese armed forces is characterized by uh, very low levels of unit and task cohesion, uh, especially vertical cohesion, the relationship between commanders and the troops. Uh, and this feeds violence, including sexual violence in different ways, in that commanders do not control the troops, uh, they do not re receive information when, uh, when abuses have been done, so they cannot easily identify uh, the perpetrators. But most importantly, I would say that the weak position of commanders you know, makes them less inclined to actually hold uh, perpetrators to account because they are afraid that they can upraise them against them. And in general, I would say that the, the very high frustrations among troops also feeds violence against civilians uh, as a way to try to assert their power uh, against them. So this is just one example of, of this sort of general dynamics, which explains not only uh, other violence, but also, also sexual violence. And we also have other, I think, quite useful literature on, on uh, psychological dimensions, especially related to combat. I think there's, there's one also has to realize that there are different kinds of, of sexual violence in war and different dynamics that, that sexual violence, the more brutal ones, more mass rapes in relation to combat situation has a slightly different logic behind it, a dynamic which is connected to, to the psychological state of being in the, in the extreme state of combat and fear and, and tension that that, that, that implies. So there are different levels, I think, different explanations which we cannot proceed. Um, Another one, I find the work of, of, of uh, Calvas, for example, also very useful in the sense that, that especially in the Congolese case, am I to be there on time? Okay. Um, I mean, the, the, the opportunities that, that conflict offers as a solution of private disputes and, and the, the porous boundaries between the military and civilian spheres is very uh, evident in the Congolese case where the armed forces live within civilians and are very sort of, uh, involved in civilian issues in different ways. And actually many of the mass rapes, which seem very strategic, are actually started with, with private disputes between civilians and military that sort of have just escalated into these uh, mass violence, including sexual violence, but also killers, etc. So you have these other dynamics, uh, which I think we, we need to look at. But then I, I don't think I maybe have time to go into that, but, but then I mean, our critique of a similar focus on sexual violence is, is also uh, related to the manifestations of that in terms of interventions. You know, what happens if all the interventions focus on just one kind of violence and conflict? And in the DRC case, and I think this is quite clear, it's come out quite a lot of reports on that now, uh, that has led to what we have called the commercialization of rape, uh, where accusations of rape can entangle in livelihood strategies. Uh, it becomes a, a very effective way of personal score settling and extortion strategies, etc., which I think is very problematic because it leads to a sort of a banalization of rape and the suffering of rape. And it also means that more and more women now are questioned uh, and the people do not believe their stories. So I think this is a very problematic manifestation of if you just sort of put all your money and effort into combating one type of, of violence. Thank you. We'll move on to Hassan. Uh, you have worked closely with victims uh, of political violence and, violence and have yourself testified in several trials against different perpetrators. So you know firsthand how hard it can be, but also what kind of knowledge, documentation, and understanding is needed in order to bring perpetra perpetrators to justice. <coughs> so what in your view and based on your work uh, are the most challenging aspects in the attempt to bring perpetrators to justice? What's the role of knowledge also in that attempt? Again, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? What is the what? What, um, what are the most challenging aspects in bringing perpetrators to justice, and what is the role of research and knowledge uh, in, in those attempts? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the most challenging is to get governments <coughs> excuse me, to cooperate with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the uh, prosecution of victims. For example, in the case of Western Europe and North America, many victims of violence, murder, sexual violence against, you know, against women and men, 
reside in North America and in Europe. They sought asylum in those countries. Now, there's a problem, for example, in the United States, if you wanted to go after someone, the problem is, the challenge is, the United States has a whole bunch of laws that eventually they probably might want to extradite the person, I mean, send the person back to Liberia, remove the person from the United States. In Europe, it may be different. <clears throat> Currently, we are, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> we've come pretty close, just like this, to, you know, nailing someone, a perpetrator in Liberia. I'm not going to name names. It's in Western Europe. Uh, this, it's in Belgium. And this person perpetrated all sort of violence, including murder and sexual violence. The Belgian authorities have been cooperated to a very good extent, you know, in, 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 in trying to bring the person to book. However, there remains enormous challenges. We think, I myself was sexually, uh, was subject to some form of sexual violence. Electrocution, I'm sorry, on my private part, when I spent six months in, in, in jail uh, in my country. Uh, now, in this case, we think that it is very important to have all of these things documented. For example, if the, you know, those who perpetrated the, the, the Holocaust, if those crimes weren't documented, some of the people that were prosecuted, that have been prosecuted now and maybe five years ago, 10, 20 years ago, probably would not have happened. And so we think it is necessary to have these things documented. Our goal is, since majority of these people reside in the United States, in North, uh, in Western Europe, and there are laws on the book in most of these countries, it is possible we can take some of these documents as we are currently doing in Europe to a prosecutor's, prosecutor's office and request that, okay, these are the victims, these are the witnesses, this is the story, this is the, this is the, uh, the statement. You can kind of check it, and we think this person can be prosecuted, you know. So in short, our work, in our opinion, we believe that prosecution must remain a necessary component in the fight against sexual violence. There may be other components, but prosecution must remain a deterrent force, especially in the case of uh, uh, Africa. It is easier for us to sit in the comfort of the West and say, okay, we'll do this research, uh, this government is not gonna do this. But if we begin to prosecute people, people are gonna be scared of doing it again. For example, everybody thought that if President Charles Taylor was arrested for war crimes and charged and, and found guilty, there will be an outburst of war. So he was arrested, and guess what? Nothing happened. And people are beginning to get used to the concept that justice can serve, prosecution can serve as a deterrent. So one big surprise that our work has produced, talking to victims, is people, after the Taylor trial, people are beginning to say, well, you think, I think, this is the perpetrator this year. I did not trust my own police force because about close to 35 to 40 percent of those who perpetrated the, those crimes constituted police force. So they would prefer to talk to you, to talk to some other people, to talk to the United Nations, to talk to people outside of Liberia. But bottom line, they definitely intend to have to see justice. And we think one way to do that is to document it. We're not promising 100%. As long as we have those documents documented, um, the person leaves, comes to the United States or comes to Canada or Western Europe, something can be done about it. And because in Liberia, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission produced a report, and then our government is very reluctant or probably lacks the political will to implement that. So if we wait for that, nothing's going to happen at all. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Dara, uh, your research, uh, as you said, has focused on how uh, rape and gang rape can be used by armed groups to force to create cohesion between fighters. Um, so if rape has this function, how do you think, what, what is the incentive then to stop rape if it has an incentive to be part of a group? Can you reflect a little bit on that? Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, there's a lot of talk in the policy discourse about the utility of rape as a weapon. Uh, rape is cheap, it's an easy weapon, 
Um, but I think there's a flip side to this that hasn't really been a big part of the discussion, and that's that rape can also be quite costly for perpetrating groups, both for the individuals in the groups and also for the armed groups themselves. Um, and in my research, I identified, I think, two ways that um, rape can be particularly costly from the perspective of the armed group. Um, the first is um, probably an obvious point, but that rape can, especially mass rape, gang rape, can easily spread sexually transmitted disease. And this is something that came up in my interviews in Sierra Leone, that um, not so much HIV, but syphilis and gonorrhea were really rampant in the conflict there. And fighters described that because they didn't have access to medications, that the diseases went untreated, and it hurt the ability of the fighters to perform as fighters. So un untreated um, versions of these diseases meant that sometimes fighters weren't able to walk or run. Um, just on the most basic level, they weren't able to function as fighters. Um, a second kind of cost, I think, and this is maybe also an obvious point, is that using rape during, during wartime just uh, dramatically undermines your support from the civilian population. Um, so I think these, these two costs, and these are just two, there are probably many others, um, suggest ways that um, we can perhaps think of some policy interventions. Um, so I think in addition to some of the efforts that were mentioned yesterday and, and today, our efforts to shame perpetrators after the fact or to threaten them with punishment or prosecution before the fact, um, I think these costs suggest that there are other kinds of tools that can be used um, to perhaps appeal to the rational side of, of armed groups. Um, so by informing armed groups that we know from past experiences that using rape can undermine uh, support, both local support and international support, um, can undermine discipline, can disrupt um, uh, command and control within the armed groups, um, and also that rape spreads disease and that this can have very devastating effects on the, the fighter's basic ability to perform as fighters. Um, but these are just a few implications. And as I said earlier, I think because um, research with research directly with perpetrators is, is still, I think, somewhat in um, nascent stages, as we continue with this research, I think we'll discover more and more um, a better understanding of what some of the incentives might be to um, intervene or and to, to um, create incentives to, to stop using rape. Thank you. Laura, um, you mentioned it already in your introduction, the role of gender in global politics is important. Uh, and in many people's efforts to explain away um, the presence of women perpetrators of violence, especially women perpetrators of sexual violence, that by emphasizing the singularity of such occurrences and trying to deny women's agency in their own violent acts. Why is it important that such perpetrators be recognized and addressed, in your view? So one of the interesting questions, kind of when you come, go down the rabbit hole, I guess, of studying women perpetrators of sexual violence in war is, what does it mean and why does it matter? And it, I kind of want to fall back on a cliche, which is it's kind of nothing and everything all at once. That is, women perpetrate sexual violence and war, and a lot of the research that talks about the causes demonstrates that women perpetrate sexual violence and war for a lot of the same reasons that men perpetrate sexual violence and war. On the other hand, that is not the way that the media frames it. It's not the way that most research frames it. Instead, it becomes an interesting question in the media, in research, and especially in jurisprudence, why do women commit wartime rape? And I argue that that and the answers to that question in the literature are problematic from both a gender studies perspective and from a legal perspective. So the answers to that question in the literature are very often singularizing women perpetrators. So women perpetrators are perpetrating because they lost their husbands or their sons in the war and they're mad. Or they're perpetrating because they're nuts and there's some sense that women perpetrators are scarier than men perpetrators. Or they're perpetrating because they are with some guy who told them to. Uh, in fact, there was a great line kind of in, I think it was a New York Times editorial when Lindy England was in trouble for the prison abuse in Iraq and it said that you know, she had anal sex with Charles Grainer, and therefore, 
uh, of course she was going to become a sexual predator in war, right? Um, some sense that, that a guy manipulates women into doing disgusting things, including sexual violence. And or there's a narrative in the literature that talks about women being likely to perpetrate sexual violence because they are of alternate sexual preference. That is, women who are violent are butch lesbians, right? Or something like that. There's absolutely no evidence that we've found that any of those are, are real explanatory factors in the reasons that women commit sexual violence. But we argue that it makes kind of a double move. The first is to say that women are less violent than men, and then that any violence that women commit is some sort of perversion of femininity. And we argue that that double move tells us something both about the law of wartime rape and about kind of what gender is and what gender subordination is. So I'm going to talk about the first real quick and then the second. Um, it matters because treating women perpetrators as different than men perpetrators is treating women different than men, and it's ultimately treating women victims different than men victims. The spectrum of things that we see that women are capable of doing, working outside of the home, taking care of themselves, heading households, has actually widened so much that we're often kind of ignorant of the fact that there are still borders to what we see women as capable of doing. Particularly, even within the feminist community, there's a sense that women are equal to and as capable of men without their flaws. <laughs> Which would be nice. <laughs> but doesn't seem to be true. <laughs> and in fact, is a different sort of inequality. Particularly, we also have a sense that gender subordination is something men do to women. And that's the only way we can understand women as its victims. In fact, when there was kind of the mainstream media started dealing with women's sexual violence and war, the first thing it started saying was, well, of course, now women are equal because they have to be equal to be doing this, right? And I think that what understanding women's perpetration shows us is that gender subordination isn't something men do to women. In fact, we're perfectly comfortable with the idea of gender subordination as something that women can do to women when we see a body on the front of Cosmo magazine that doesn't look like we think women's bodies look and then creates unreasonable expectations. But gender subordination is also something women do to women and men do to men and women do to men. Uh, and I think that the perpetration of sexual violence in war towards differently sexed bodies by differently sexed bodies doesn't make it less gendered. It complicates our understanding of what masculinities and femininities are in war and who inflicts them, who feminizes whom. That is, women can feminize men uh, as perpetrators of sexual violence. And I think that that changes how we see gender subordination not only in kind of general, not only in the sense of sex subordination in war, right, but more generally. And I think it makes us rethink things. And I guess I'm going to conclude real quickly by saying I also do think it makes us rethink the international law of, of wartime rape. Um, the international law of wartime rape is something that I, I've been interested in kind of, as I said, my inner lawyer for quite a while. And it's a jurisprudence that's moving real quickly. That is, there was almost no international law of wartime rape 20 or 25 years ago, and now there's a fairly sophisticated jurisprudence. At the same time, most international legal cases about wartime rape assume that there needs to be a male perpetrator for there to be a female victim, which both has kind of consequences in the, the prosecution of female perpetrators but also consequences in the victims' rights of both male and female victims of female perpetrators. And one of the projects that the Rape Among Women book is trying to do is ask, what would the legal structures need to look like in order to understand wartime rape as a gendered crime, but also understand that that is true whether or not the perpetrator is male or female, and kind of take away that sex dichotomy from the perpetration in order to make both more effective prosecution, which, uh, as we've already heard, is crucially important, but also to make more effective perpetration and protection of the victims of that perpetration. 
because very often what we found in the cases in the Rape Among Women book is some sense of that if there wasn't a male perpetrator, that is, if you weren't penetrated by a man, uh, then you weren't raped. Uh, so the question is, well, were you really raped? And and often the answer is no. If a woman did it for the per if a woman did it for the purposes of providing victim services, so that's kind of the next direction of my research is how do you provide victim services and how do you change the prosecution in order to effectively prosecute kind of what the crime of war rape is, which I think is very different because we defined it when we only thought men did it. And we thought about the causes when we only thought men did it. And then we brought up the punishments and the jurisprudence when we only thought men did it, which was only part of the picture. Thank you, Laura. Um, before we move on, I've been asked to ask all the panelists to speak slowly. So <laughs> please. <laughs> um, Martina. Uh, you have a long history with the Victims' Voices or Vivo International, an organization which addresses the consequences of traumatic stress on um, violence and conflict-affected individuals and communities, as you also mentioned before. Why is addressing the issue of PTSD, traumatic stress, and repetitive violence an important part of ending the cycle of sexual violence? You said it as a headline, but okay. now you get to explore. Slowly. Slowly, <laughs> but quick anyway. So today we all know that the prevalence rate of trauma spectrum disorders, not only post-traumatic stress disorder, but also depression, suicide, fallacy, alcohol abuse and dependence, but also aggression is very high in conflict and post-conflict settings. The more traumatic experiences people have, the more likely they suffer from trauma spectrum disorder. And this does not only cause suffering for the individual, but for the entire community, because these people are not only psychologically impaired, they're also impaired in their all day functioning. And so we see a dramatic increase in family violence as well. And a terrible cycle of violence is set into motion. So these people who are affected, they cannot take care of their families anymore. They cannot contribute to build up a peaceful community or on an even bigger level, a constitutional democracy. So what is needed is an evidence-based treatment. Evidence-based treatment is not a luxury. It's a prerequisite for building up peaceful communities again. So what we did actually is that in different post-conflict settings, we were training lay people in conducting trauma treatment and we implemented mental health assistance programs so that we have cascade models where one generation of trained counselor is going to train the next one and they can conduct trauma treatment to the people who are affected. And what we've learned is it is possible to implement these structures and we evaluated the structures in cooperation with different international universities. And the treatment approach we implemented is called narrative exposure therapy. It's NET, NET. And um, what we do is we reconstruct in detail what happened during the traumatic event with the clients. So we go back into the past and we go step by step in chronological order through their life and in detail they narrate what has happened to them. So we have eyewitness testimonies afterwards and this does not only help to heal the memory pathology that is underlying post-traumatic stress disorder, it also helps to overcome the speechless terror that we have in post-conflict settings. The treatment is very short, it's only around 10 sessions and it easily can be carried out by local lay persons that are trained and we can build these cascade models. And people who were treated did not only recover from symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, there was also an increase in their all day functioning. So they can take care again of their families, they can contribute to build up the community. So we have a long history of working with victims, but does that also work with perpetrators? Can we treat perpetrator? Will they talk to us? Will it help the victim if we treat perpetrator? 
And today, based on the research we did, I can confidently answer with yes. Yes, we can talk to these perpetrators and we even have to talk to them because treating the perpetrator is an effective way of preventing further violence. And of course, it also was already mentioned, the term perpetrator really includes different groups. Um, on the one hand, we have child soldiers who were abducted, who were forced to commit cruelties, who experience sexual violence themselves. There is a lot of sexual violence going on also in armed groups. And then, of course, we have others who voluntarily join the armed group, maybe because of a lack of other options or poverty or feelings of revenge or also high level of aggression so that they were really fascinated also by violence. So can we talk to this man? Would they talk about what they have experienced? Talking about what you have experienced as a victim is one thing. Talking about what you have committed is something different. Yes. Uh, it worked with the support of peer teachers also. We had the chance to interview 200 ex-combatants in DRC with a specially prepared questionnaire for perpetrators. And we asked them questions like, have you ever participated in a massacre? Did you ever feel the need to fight? Or would you agree or disagree to the sentence violence against women happened because combatants have to prove to their fellows that they are strong? And encouraged by these surveys we did with the questionnaires, we built up a new form of narrative exposure therapy that is called Fornet. It's basically narrative exposure therapy for the rehabilitation of forensic offenders, so narrative exposure therapy for uh, perpetrators. And very similar to narrative exposure therapy, we talk about the whole life of the combatant with a focus on traumatic events they have experienced as victims, but also with a focus on the cruelties they committed. And one thing is we want to heal the memory pathology like we did before also in victims, but we also want to explore the ambivalent feelings they have about the cruelties they committed. And they were always ambivalent feelings. And we want to anchor these cruelties in the past so that they are not yet anymore there in the present. And again, it was possible to talk in detail about everything. And I just would like to read out a small part of a narration of one of our combatants. Um, so it's only a little piece of the narration. We were in the forest. We had a woman that we wanted to rape. Two other soldiers were older than me and raped her before it was my turn. The others made their business and left. For me, seeing how they had sex with her was very arousing. When it was my turn, my penis was erected and I felt the lust to have sex. The woman was lying on the ground. She looked very weak. Her eyes were shut. I opened my trousers. I spread her legs and inserted my penis into her vagina. She was already very tired from the sex with the two soldiers before. She even did not do anything anymore to keep me away from her. Inside her, it felt weird. It was very wet from the other two soldiers. I felt disgusted and my erection went away. As she was already very tired, I took my penis out of her. I saw sperms of the others and blood on my penis. It was disgusting. I could not continue to have sex with her. I went away. I hoped that no one saw that I did not finish my business. I did not want them to think I'm weak or I'm a woman. I did not experience, I did not like that experience and I felt extremely disgusted. So accept what has happened in the past. We can't change that anymore, but we can't ignore it when we try to reintegrate combatants. But we can learn from this, and we can learn a lot from this testimony about what was going on. And once we have talked about this, we can question how do you think about it today? How do you feel about it today? So our individual treatment is followed then by group sessions where ex-combatants together with a therapist discuss the role change, the change from combatant to civilian, the disadvantages and advantages of both roles. And based on our research studies, we evaluated this approach. We can say that it does not only have a positive effect 
on trauma symptoms, combatants also have, but it helps a lot to change their closeness to the network of combatants. That means they are not going to meet the others anymore. And this basically means the likelihood that they are going back to armed groups and continue their violent behavior is changed. And it's changed also if they go back to the community that they're not going to continue to show this violent behavior in the community. So it's anchored in the past, it's analyzed why it happened there, and it's understood, and then it's not going to happen anymore. So the treatment is for us the base for the reintegration and the pinch bar to stop not only the cycle of sexual violence, and the time ex-combatants or combatants are spending in reintegration centers are, is a window of opportunity for mental health assistance. And so perpetrator treatment in the end is prevention of further violence. And I think, as Dara already mentioned, we have to break the silence. We have to talk to them if we want to break the cycle of violence. We can't ignore one part of the community. Thank you, Martina. Uh, then it's a big jump in a way to Elizabeth who will talk about those who do not commit these crimes and what we can learn, learn from that. Um, as you said yourself, your research has shown that rape is not an inevitable aspect of war. In fact, there have been conflicts where war time rape is rare. And this is because groups see sexual violence as counterproductive to their goals or norms. So what can actors at the local, national, and international level do to ensure that sexual violence increasingly is seen as a counterproductive tactic in conflict? Thanks, Inger. Before I get to that, I want to contextualize um, my reply a little bit more in the research. Um, and I would like to call your attention to a USIP policy special report, I guess it's called, a special report um, that we put together for this event, summarizing um, some of the recent research. Um, uh, it's authored by Dara, uh, Amelia Hoover-Green, who's also here, and myself, and it's available out there. Uh, and it draws as well on the work of some other uh, colleagues, uh, particularly those in the Young Scholars Network, which is such a fantastic thing coming out of this event. So just a couple other notes about what we're learning. One is that state forces are more likely than rebel forces to engage in high levels of sexual violence. Often our imagery is not that of state forces, but if one looks at the data, uh, that uh, appears to be true. Second. Again, a lot of the imagery comes from conflicts in Africa. But if you look at the fraction of conflicts that report some level of sexual violence, and you look at the fraction of conflicts that have high levels, the highest levels of sexual violence, and compare that fraction in Africa to, for example, Eastern Europe, the fraction of conflicts with high levels of sexual violence is higher in Eastern Europe. Africa has a lot of conflicts. It has a lot of conflicts with sexual violence, but as a fraction of conflicts, it's not higher than Eastern Europe, and that is a very important corrective to some of the journalistic kind of discussions and um, the imagery uh, uh, and so on. I mentioned this fact of asymmetry, which I think, again, is loaded with policy and also um, uh, uh, consequences for our understanding about when rape occurs and when it doesn't. Um, and the point here is that if you have these sustained asymmetries, then it should bring our attention to the armed group and not general society characteristics like patriarchy or the level of rape before the war and so on. So focus on the armed group its institutions, and the culture, and the mutual reinforcement between culture and institution. But before I go there, I want to just call your attention to underline something that Maria said. Maria emphasized that the logic underlining, underlying massive rape during combat is likely very different from uh, the logic underlying rape in other settings. And at an even more basic level, the logic underlying rape during war is very different than the logic underlying, for example, forced abortion. 
So I think we often use the phrase sexual violence, and often what we mean by that is rape. I think we should say rape when we mean rape. We should say sexual torture when we mean sexual torture, and so on. Because if we don't, then we won't understand the patterns that we're trying to analyze, and we'll be misguided in our efforts at prevention and prosecution. So another unsettling fact is that rape can often be massive without having been ordered. And this draws our attention to a number of issues here. And I was so glad that we had the discussion yesterday about uh, rape within the US military, and in particular within the US Army, but not exclusively. And also, it is quite high in the academies that trade officers for the US military. This is not rape that is ordered, but it is a long-standing practice within that institution that is proving very difficult to eradicate. So it's an indication, I think, that um, the, uh, it's important that we think about the ways in which rape of civilians can be widespread without having been ordered. Now, if that's happening, the leaders know. Right? They may be disingenuous and claim that they didn't or claim that they didn't have effective command of those troops. In fact, they know in these days of widespread reporting about rape of civilians. They know. And if they show effective command, that is, the troops, in fact, engage in complicated offensive and defensive maneuvers. Uh, it occurs in locations under direct commander's control then even though it hasn't been ordered, of course they are legally liable and can be prosecuted. So this is not about the legal implications, but about understanding why it occurs. So why might it occur? A practice of widespread rape without having been ordered? Well, one basic fact is the leaders don't take it seriously. Right? They don't see it as something that has to be addressed. They may think that the costs of disciplining the officers that allow it would be high. Maybe in other ways, they see those officers as being well performing in the field. So they value that aspect of their service and don't mind so much the fact that those officers themselves or perhaps their combatants are also engaging in rape. They may implicitly or explicitly understand that rape of civilians is some sort of the package of compensation for their combatants. Again, they are legally liable for this. This is something that, that Maria and her co-author Maria have explored in great detail, the logic underlying this. And part of that, I think, that misunderstanding has to do with uh, something one might call a kind of substitution theory that rape is a substitute for consensual sex. And that often goes hand in hand with some idea that men just must have to have sex. Meaning intercourse with a female, consensual or not. And that normalizes then the idea that, as was emphasized uh, by a colleague yesterday, um, my combatants have to have leave to go to brothels. We'll tolerate brothels no matter the unsanitary conditions around the base. And also, if, uh, if there's rape, then that's just part of that awfully ugly phrase, the collateral damage of war. But it can be effectively prohibited. So some armed organizations make a policy decision that they implement effectively to absolutely prohibit rape. Field commanders, the actual field commanders on the ground are, of course, absolutely crucial if this is to be effective. And um, to, in order to effectively prohibit rape, um, the institutions of the armed group are, should be a crucial uh, part of our understanding of what makes that effective prohibition crucial. I draw here on the work of Amelia Hoover Green, who's looked in great detail at one of these asymmetric conflicts, so the Civil War in El Salvador, where state forces 
engaged early in the war in quite massive rape of civilians on operations, and in a very sustained way throughout the war engaged in sexual torture of political prisoners, both men and women. So what are these institutions? So one is recruitment. Dara has documented in her group work that groups that abduct recruits are quite likely to engage not just in rape, but in gang rape. So institutions, if you build an institution where you do not rely on forced abduction of your recruits is, can contribute to the effective prohibition of rape. Military training is the least of the training that combatants in these groups undergo. Groups that don't engage in rape of civilians don't just do military training, they do deep political indoctrination of their combatants. It's repeated, it's not just a one-off, oh, this is your code of conduct, take this, carry it around in little cards, this is what you're not supposed to do. No, this is repeated, ongoing inculcation about why we fight, why it's important that we respect civilians. Uh, this is, in fact, the new society that we're building. We are already practicing the building of a new society, and the way we treat civilians is an important part of this. These norms must be enforced by those field commanders. They're crucial in this story. We can't just talk about leaders and combatants. We have to talk about that chain of command, and in particular, the field commanders on the ground. And sixth, we need to hold those field commanders accountable. Indeed, that whole chain of command accountable, not just we in the sense of prosecution, but the armed group itself needs to hold that chain of command accountable. And that means that there has to be another institution in place within this armed group. There has to be an effective chain of internal intelligence so that those leaders and field commanders understand and know exactly what their combatants are in fact doing and hold that, those lower levels of leadership uh, accountable, uh, accountable for their activities. So those are some ideas about how some armed groups, both states and non-state groups, can effectively prohibit wartime rape. Thank you, Lee. I think that we've now had a good section here about, let's say, the learning and unlearning of sexual violence crimes, if I may sum up like that. I'm going to give the word to Kim, who will now be in charge of uh, discussions with the audience. Thank you again. That was fascinating. And if yesterday is any indication, I think folks are going to be jumping to comment and ask questions. Um, and so Inger and I wanted to open it up, but we wanted to also put a couple thoughts on the table along with the panelists' thoughts and invite your questions and also your ideas. Um, we've heard a lot about societal gender construction and its role and its implications for the perpetration of sexual violence and conflict. And we were wondering if anyone has thoughts about how, how we can address those constructions or deconstruct. Um, is that part of of the, the strategy, is it realistic? Um, and granted, from, from the work that we've heard about, um, it sounds like there are situations in which groups do not commit or perpetrate sexual violence, but in a scenario where it is normalized, are there ways or thoughts as to how to denormalize rape in these contexts? And if anyone has thoughts on research gaps and priorities, or also examples of how to take research that you've been doing and translate it into actual action or programmatic um, improvement. That would be great. We're trying to gather some of those thoughts at this symposium also. Okay, so we'll take some questions. I think we'll do another batch of three at a time. Uh, let's start in the back with uh, Clemence. Um, hi, my name is Clémence. So I work on uh, South Sudan. I'm completing my PhD in history. And I think that um, while this panel was extremely interesting, I was very happy. Um, one further um, thing that I would like to add 
apart from the diversity of strategies of different armed groups, sometimes in the same war, um, whose strategies might shift depending on the chronology of the war and external events and the international community's influence, um, I would like to add also to what Elizabeth Wood was saying, that I think we should be thinking about the economics of war. Um, because we, we talked yesterday about the fact that we have a lot of unconventional wars and uh, predation is one of the uh, biggest, uh, I think most important dynamics of those wars. And I think that, for example, in my research, um, it occurs that the lack of resources uh, for commanders or for their troops in the ground pushed some of them, of course, to loot more and created opportunities for sexual violence. So I think that it would be interesting to include uh, some reflections about predation and resources and what kind of uh, responsibility does the international community have because those are, you know, often relief resources being diverted and then uh, instrumentalizing civilians, amongst whom are women. Uh, and then last, um, Laura Sjöberg, uh, I, I really enjoy your work. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering, uh, since you work on stereotypes uh, on women, what you thought of um, this idea that women need, I mean, not need, but this idea that women reconstruct societies in the post-war. Do you think that it perpetuates some kind of stereotype? Because at the end of the day, uh, the thing that it evokes for me is, um, okay, so not only do we suffer the decisions of men, but then we have to rebuild the societies afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Thanks, Clemence. Okay, let's be brief in our questions because we really only have about 25 minutes for this part. Okay, so I apologize. Um, Catherine, and then also, uh, the, is that Leslie? The lady in the back in the glasses after Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Keenis, uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. I wanted to uh, come back to the question of definitions and how we call things what we call them. I re really would like, uh, both from a legal perspective, to sort out this rape and sexual torture difference. Um, I'm aware that when the Penn State uh, uh, sexual violence and, and rape of young boys came forward, that rape in our own uh, American uh, legislation is only considered uh, of women, men to women, that the rape of boys was called sexual deviance, and that in fact uh, our judicial system had to change the law to actually effectively prosecute. Now, if that's in the United States, how does that translate across the world, how we define rape? And so I, I, I'm going to call upon Laura and her le inner legal system there and anybody else. But I do think we have some definitional problems, what it means. Some of them are legal, some of the ways we use the terms. And I would really love us to sort that out. And the other word I want to understand, is it sexual or is it sexualized? And those are just questions that I have. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. Let's take one more question right up here. Yes, you. Thanks. My name is Jean Ward. Uh, my name is Jean Ward, and I'm a global consultant working on gender-based violence for violence against women and girls in humanitarian settings. Um, I am here representing the GBB Area of Responsibility, or AOR. It's the global coordinating body on GBV in humanitarian contexts. And I don't have a question, but I wanted to respond to your request for information about work that's being done and research that's required and so on. Uh, the GBV AOR has, for the last year or so, um, been slowly developing its work around creating a prevention framework to guide GBV AOR members in addressing various types of GBV in humanitarian settings, including sexual violence. Um, and the prevention framework 
really speaks to so many of the topics that we've covered in the last uh, day and a half. Um, it looks at um, the many types of prevention interventions that can take place according to stages of humanitarian response. So pre-emergency, uh, emergency, and then you know, sort of recovery post-emergency. It looks at the different levels at which we target our interactions. So at the international level, at the national level, uh, at the uh, community level, the level of relationship, and the level of the individual. Um, and it looks at sort of the, at all of those levels and in all of those stages at risk factors and protective factors uh, for, so for um, violence perpetration and um, uh, protective factors for violence um, avoidance, if you will. Um, and just a couple points that I want to emphasize that um, all of the work is grounded in an understanding of the gender dimensions of violence against women and girls. Um, and we look at sexual violence not only uh, as it's perpetrated by uh, armed actors, but of course, you know, we know that the majority of perpetration is actually not by armed actors, whether they're um, state or non-state. Um, so we need to look at you know, the, the multiple um, actors. Um, and we need to recognize, I think, as Jody said yesterday, that, um, that perpetration happens on a continuum. It's not just an isolated fact of war. Um, so we need to, you know, when we're addressing the underlying factors, um, we have to look at the cultural issues. Um, and then the last uh, point is that with regard to sort of the discussion around um, issues of impunity, addressing impunity is one aspect of, of prevention. Um, but in this framework, when we're trying to sort of think about all of the sort of risks and pr protective factors, it's, I wouldn't say a, s a small component, but just one in a whole sort of spectrum of preventive activities. Now, what we've done specifically, and I'm almost finished, is the um, looking at social norms. We're doing a lot of work um, trying to scale up um, our ability to sort of focus Jenny, on I social norms. I'm so, in, so in sorry. I'm so settings. sorry. We've only got about 20 minutes. Is there, can we stop in 10 seconds? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so what we need, and this is true of all kinds of uh, programming on gender-based violence in humanitarian settings, is more evidence-based. Uh, okay. for our interventions. And that's the key recommendation in terms of research, okay. is doing research around evidence for programming. Thank you. I think we're agreed on the need for evidence. Um, do you, shall we respond to some of the comments and questions? Okay. I can still talk while we're looking at me, so there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I guess I, I wanna, I'm gonna start at the end of the questions and kind of move back real quick. Uh, the is it sexual or is it sexual violence? I think it's both. And one of the things that my theoretical work on gender and war thinks a lot about is the extent to which masculinization is a causus belli on kind of a, a state level or a group level, but also that masculinism is how we motivate individuals to kill, right? Like, which is something that I think is understudied in war theorizing, like how you get people to kill who don't usually do so. And I think a lot of that has to do with gender tropes. And I think so long as masculinization is a motivation and feminization is a weapon, the sex and sexual violence thing is always going to be fuzzy kind of in how we fight wars. We have to understand gender stereotypes to get there, I think. Um, and I think that's something that kind of dovetails with the question back there, which is in some sense it's an odd thing where most women have little say in most wars, and overwhelmingly, though I study women perpetrators, women play kind of a more victim role in wars, and yet there's this, well, after the war's over, we need women in charge. Why? Because women are better at peace, right? And in some sense, it's both an unrealistic expectation, that is, they aren't 
but it's also some sense of solve the problem you didn't cause without having been recognized as a stakeholder in it. And I think both of those are very gendered problems. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of piles on the gendered problem that you bring up about the legal frameworks, which uh, in the Rape Among Women book, I found 40 different legal frameworks, which is, which is very difficult to kind of give you generalizations about. But I think that one of the things that the legal frameworks are surprisingly good at is recognizing different physical forms of rape, right? That is that penetration happens different places, different ways, uh, and things like that. I think that the two things that they're very bad at is recognizing that women can commit rape. Um, and in fact, a lot of the prosecutions of women when they happen is about inciting rather than committing even when they've done both. Um, and then, like, while there is some jurisprudence about men being able to be raped, very often the testimony provided doesn't fit the strict definition because men are less willing to say, I was raped than I was abused, right? So in some sense, there's jurisprudential borders and barriers, but there's also kind of the social norms against talking about it as rape that make the perpetrate the like when men are the victim the the jurisprudence about it is more often vaguely sexual violence or even vaguely just abuse uh because of the taboo of testifying to and about it and that taboo i think is it exists for women but it's gendered differently maybe did you want to address the economic question too or or is there any first question? Uh, yeah let, let me just make a couple of comments building on what laura said uh, about legal definitions versus other definitions. Um, I didn't know that number 40, that's astounding. Um, but uh, just in the US, what the definition of rape is varies by state, by state. Uh, so that may have been true in Pennsylvania, it's not true in other states, whether a husband can rape a wife, whether marital rape is legally rape varies by state. There are global experts in international law here, so I won't um, talk about that. You'll have lots of opportunity to, to talk about that. Um, but I think what's important, among other things, is what combatants understand rape to be. And I think that one of the implications of the research that's being done, uh, one of the policy implications is and challenges is to think about how to convey effectively to those field commanders as well as combatants and then up the chain of command what, how they should be thinking about rape or what is the legal definition of rape under international law. Uh, and also, as Jared's been emphasizing, to really emphasize the cost to the armed group should their combatants engage um, uh, in rape. I, and part of that effort, I think, should build on the fact that there are very effective state forces and very effective non-state actors who build warrior cultures that are very effective and yet they don't rape. So it is possible to disentangle the understanding about what manhood is to the extent that the armed group is dominated by ideas of masculinity be the combatants male or female, but to untangle the notion of what a good warrior is from some sort of implication about sexual domination. We have lots of groups we can point to, that's quite possible, um, and we need to engage it uh, as one of the implications of the research that's, that's being done. Then I did want to comment um, uh, on this idea of wartime rape as a continuum. Yes, in some broad sense, clearly there's a continuum in that rape um, occurs before wars, during wars, often at a higher level after war. But I think that to overemphasize the continuum is to miss some of the important uh, lived experiences of wartime rape and also to uh, forego some opportunities try to understand its logic. Wartime rape tends to be massively more brutal with long, long-term consequences. 
the fraction of victims who suffer multiple perpetrator rape, where the question has been asked, seems to be two thirds, three quarters of victims had multiple perpetrators, whereas that fraction varies during peacetime. Sometimes it's 5%, sometimes it's 15%, but it's just way, way, way lower, which then draws attention again to these um, social processes. Uh, and then something that Vera emphasized earlier, the fact that people who in peacetime would never engage in rape under the lived experience of war may become rapists. Maria, you have some thoughts too? Uh, just a, a comment on, on Jamal's comment and question. Uh, and I think it's very important you pointed out the, the, that the dynamics within our groups and our movements change. Uh, so it's just not static, it changes. Uh, uh, so you know, in that sense, it's also a problem. We have this tendency also to individualize and not to talk about good commanders, bad commanders, and good groups and bad groups. But you can see that even within the same commander can, can uh, act in very different ways depending on the dynamics within the groups, etc. But uh, also in relation to resources, I think, I mean, uh, you are right, but I think that there's some also a problem in that we tend to very much differentiate between uh, more opportuni opportunistic armed groups, which are driven by sort of resource extraction aims, and more ideological ones. And I think that, yes, I mean, that does explain some things, but it's something that's very clear in the Congolese case, and not just for the armed forces, but also other armed groups, is that uh, even for business, you know, they, they are very heavily dependent on good relations with the civilians, and it depends, depends on the kind of resources and the kind of business they are engaged with. But generally, uh, I would say the most problematic there is the frequent redeployment of troops. And if you know you're going to be deployed in an area during a short time, you are much more inclined to engage in more, more violent forms of resource ex extraction than if you know you're going to be deployed in the same area for maybe one or two years, then you engage in, in developing better relationships with the civilians and the level of uh, the violence decreases. Thanks. Uh, you know, in our case, what we have found, based on our work, specifically in Liberia, has been that uh, in most of the cases, these crimes, these rapes, have been, I mean, have been, have been uh, occurring because armed groups wanted to compel compliance. Now, it is not at the highest level that we found that the war is that the leader himself would say, "Well, go and rape people." No, but. They don't pay these guys, so they tell them, go and pay yourself whatever you're able to do, loot, whatever. They don't say rip, go and pay yourself. Now you tell a dropped uh, gun-toting soldier in the field, go and pay yourself whatever. I mean, he looks at a female as his pay. He does whatever he wants, you know. So in that context, Generally, in, in the library context, they were generally used to humiliate and as an instrument of control and fear, to inspire fear in a community. They didn't seek to establish good relation unless they were under attack at a particular point. Now, I don't have much time to explain all of that. But basically, they, you know, Machiavelli theory, basically, they thought it was better to be feared than to be loved. In that way, civilians in their controlled areas wouldn't dare to send information to their rival faction. Other comments for this round of questions? Let's take um, two, three more questions. Please keep them really brief. Uh, right here in the purple sweater, and then gentleman here, number two. And if he has not asked a question yet, I see people who have already asked questions. Um, this gentleman here has some questions. Thank you. Hi, my name is Crystal Corman. I'm a consultant at the World Bank. And I've written my question down to keep it concise. Um, I would like to direct it towards Hassan and to Martina. I'm very interested in um, post-conflict reconstruction and healing, especially for the trauma of victims. And first of all, um, has there ever been, in, in your experience and in your research, was there ever reluctance to mental health therapy? Um, and maybe
maybe you thought of that and worked to prevent that. And how, if you did, then how so? Um, how did you make it acceptable culturally? Um, and second, does retelling of the story provide some sense of healing if it's in a trial or in um, prosecution, in documenting the details, and also in therapy? Are both therapeutic for the victim? And finally, um, how is the healing process if there is one but there is not the other? If there is legal justice sought but there's not therapy or vice versa? Thank you. I'd like to say thank you to the panelists. My question goes to the ability. Your work is uh, trying to document uh, evidence that might lead to potential prosecution of uh, violators or perpetrators of sexual crimes who are enjoying the sanctuary of Western countries here in the United States. I'd just like to ask that either Liberia is one country where the population of pre-trial detainees is very high. The number of persons personally convicted of sexual offenses is far less as compared to having some 200 persons pre-trial detainees who are perpetrators of sexual offense. Is there any law in the United States or elsewhere where perpetrators of such crimes have been starting, giving your evidence that you have gathered so that these people can be prosecuted where they are instead of trying to bring them back home where they are seen as heroes returning to their homeland. We have a special case in point. I'd like to call his name, Mr. George Bode, who was one of those warring faction heads, was the, sent back to the United States, I mean to, to Liberia from the United States. On his arrival, he was giving a heroic Counselor. welcome. Counselor, we got your question. Can you, can you talk about that case later with Mr. Yeah, my question, my question is, is it possible? Are there laws, are there treaties between Liberia, say Liberia, and the United States where perpetrators residing here can be prosecuted instead of trying to extradite them home? Thank you. Okay, last question. My name is uh, William Payne. I'm a graduate student at York University. Uh, my question is for Dr. Wood. Um, I, I'm wondering, with the, I'm thinking about the context of Colombia or Mexico where the violence is changing, uh, where it's either post-conflict or it's not conflict, but there is high levels of violence and there's armed groups that are uh, very much tied to an economy of, of uh, illegal activity. And I want to understand if, if you've thought about the implications of your research for those kind of armed groups. Uh, and I'm interested because I'm looking at uh, violence against sexual and gender minorities in Colombia and Mexico. Sandra? Yeah, I can start. Um, the first question regarding healing. Actually, we're working with some international academic institutions trying to explore ways to see how we can, you know, have a, a healing aspect to our work. However, there are other institutions in Liberia who have some level of knowledge on that. We are networking with them. But I think it would be a better idea if we had our own areas where we can do these healings. But then you talk about, uh, you know, documenting the story, how does that help the victim and going to the trial, basically. I was a victim myself, uh, torture and, and, and in part sexual violence, uh, six months in jail in Liberia. Now, when I moved to the United States, I lived in Boston. Uh, what helped me in part was the Amnesty International guy, Joshua Robinson, asked me, you know, that if I spoke about it more often, it will help to like de-traumatize me, if you like. So I spoke more about it at many institutions in the United States about my experience, and today it helped me a lot, and I'm trying to help other people. But I think that's a very good idea, so we will take that into consideration. The second aspect would be law. If there are laws on the books in the United States where I'm a journalist, we have lawyers and we're exploring that. But I did work on
on the George Miller case, I work on the Chucky Taylor case um, with, you know, uh, some Fed's authority. Now, what I do understand, Chucky Taylor is an American citizen. He had, there was a wide range of, you know, allegations against him, which included rape. And witnesses were brought into the United States for trial held in Miami. He, being an American citizen, there is a 1992 American law that forbids American citizens from going overseas and committing this crime, which part of which is war crime, I mean, uh, is rape and all of those. So he was put to jail in Miami, 97 or so years. George Foley is a Liberian citizen, and he had he lied on his immigration application form. So what the U.S. did was, I think they, 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 they were trying to do two trials, an admin trial, administrative trial, and criminal trial. They couldn't go ahead with the criminal trial because there was a lack of, largely a lack of cooperation on the part of some Liberians to be able to gather evidence. And then they sent him back. For us, we don't ask anybody to be sent to Liberia for trial. I, I know exactly, I agree with you, you work in the prosecution office, prosecutor's office in Liberia. So there's a, a huge backlog, which I know. We want victims who torture, who raped women in Africa, and I sitting comfortably in United States, Canada, and Western Europe to be tried in those countries, prosecuted, and if they're found guilty, they, they spend their time there. That's what we, we want, not to send them to Liberia. The Bullock case was totally, uh, you know, they couldn't get him on, on any criminal charge. So because he lied on immigration form, they had him removed from Liberia. And if I can add just a quick sentence to that, like, there are all sorts of legal barriers to prosecuting non-Americans, especially for <laughs> crimes committed outside of the United States. But there's actually a tort law in the United States, which is pretty interesting. It's civil jurisprudence. You can actually sue someone for damages in American courts and you don't get them put in jail, but you get the benefits of a hearing and things like that. And if they do have any financial assets, the United States can actually attack those. So while we really can't do criminal prosecutions here, uh, we can kind of put together trials uh, in some sense where you sue for damages for war crimes committed outside of the United States. That's a big inner lawyer you have there, Laura. <laughs> Actually, it's not so inner, I think. Um, yeah. Martina, <laughs> Martina and Libby, let's respond to yeah. some of the questions. Um, let me go back to your questions about reluctance toward psychological treatment, mental health assistance. Maybe to give you a little bit of background where we're coming from, we started our treatment in refugee camps in Uganda with refugees from Congo who have, with women who have never been to school. And the kind of treatment approach we have is that we just go in chronological order through their whole life and we focus and we guide them through the traumatic event. So it's oral storytelling, and that's something we basically find in each culture of the world. And it's a normal process when you think back of the time when you were a child and you were riding your bike and you had an accident. What did you do? You run to your mother and you told her about it, and she calmed you down and she gave you a support and assistance. But all out of a sudden, if it's getting traumatic or shameful, we stop talking about it. And we also don't want to listen anymore. So. Of course, people are avoiding talking about it. It's one of the core symptoms of PTSD, of post-traumatic stress disorder, and we need to help them to overcome this avoidance. But we also have to be aware, at least that's uh, a story of my country, that also a lot of therapists are really avoiding. So it's not only the avoidance of the survivor of violence, it's also that we are avoiding listening to their stories directly and talking to them directly of what has happened. Everybody only tries to calm you down and say, yeah, yeah, but yeah, now you're safe, now it's over. It doesn't help. We have to talk about what has happened in the past. So we have to break the silence. Silence never helps the victim. And you also relate it to legal cases, to court cases. Hassan just mentioned that talking about what has happened to you brings you some relief, helps you to overcome traumatization. This is a good example that it really helps to talk about what has happened to you, but people who are clinically traumatized, very few of them manage to actually testify what has happened. <coughs> we analyzed 
protocols of asylum seekers of the first hearing when they came to Germany. And honestly speaking, the ones who were severely traumatized, they did not mention anything of what they have experienced. They didn't mention torture, they didn't mention rape, nothing like that. So it's very difficult for people. That's why we would say, first you need a trauma treatment so that you can learn again to talk about what has happened to you and later on you can testify. But maybe it's not the best thing to pull them right to the court before giving them an adequate treatment because then it really can cause another suffering if you're not able to talk about what has happened to you. And don't underestimate also what it means if somebody's really listening to your story and even writing it down and you have a written document. We had so many people who have never been to school, but you know, getting this document of your life story, 20 pages, is such a gift to them. And they say, I will give it to my grandchildren that one day they understand what has happened to us and that they don't make the same mistake as we did. Just a footnote uh, about the question of legal avenues within the U.S., another sphere are, is deportation hearings. So people who are found to be in the U.S. illegally, uh, judges are now allowing uh, evidence about what they had done back when they were, for example, a very high-level official in the Salvadoran Army, was admitted into testimony in a hearing about being in the U.S. illegally. So that's another uh, uh, legal strategy, which is quite new. Um, so to go to the question about sexual violence by groups that are criminal gang, perhaps drug trafficking gangs, and um, what are the, what's the relevance for this work uh, in that sitting? I think that some of the logics are quite similar. So, for example, the targets are often chosen uh, punitively, so activists, uh, people demanding land back. Uh, people demanding accountability for the violence and the abuse that the group is carrying out in an area are often targeted with sexual violence. So in Colombia, there's a, a, a terrible pattern of threats of sexual violence, sexual violence against um, women activists. Uh, forced displacement to protect uh, resources as um, uh, sexual violence is, can be used in that setting. I think also that uh, some of the, the kind of culture of armed groups can be similar in that there's a kind of imposition of the group's um, uh, social norms on the population, so imposing a certain vision of gender normativity uh, in the kind of targeting uh, that you're talking about, uh, uh, but also a kind of culture of entitlement so that Quite young girls are um, approached and uh, offered all sorts of um, uh, reasons to go attend parties and so on, and then that can evolve into a scenario of quite long-lasting abuse. So I think that there are some similarities. I think what in some ways makes it harder is that you don't have the international legal tools about the laws of war, command of responsibility, effective control whereby you can hold leaders responsible for the abuse of, of civilians and, and hopefully get some sort of leverage over the behavior of the group, or at least I don't think you do. Maybe I'm uh, wrong about that. Uh, and it puts the emphasis then on strengthening the capacity of national actors to investigate, capture, prosecute. The reason we were pushing the Q&A part a little bit is because we wanted to save a little bit of time at the very end, again, to challenge our panelists to one or two sentences, less than a minute really, to just share a parting thought or recommendation about ways to just improve our understanding about the perpetration of sexual and gender-based violence and conflict, and also any thoughts about um, prevention or the development of potential perpetrators. So let's start on that and we can end but I think I would just end as I started uh, to emphasize that, that we need to situate sexual violence better in the context of other violence. And firstly, as I highlighted here, louder. Uh, firstly, as I uh, highlighted here, I think that doing that will make us understand the dynamics behind sexual violence better. Uh, 
Another reason why we could put sexual violence in the context of other violence is also to minimize, but also to talk about the, the commercialization of rape, which can become a consequence if we just focus on that. But also, I think we have a responsibility to the women and men, of course, but women uh, in these cases, since they are the ones who are seen as the primary victims and are the primary victims of rape, that women in conflict are also exposed to a range of other kinds of violence. And, and we are doing them an injustice in just focusing on sexual violence. Uh, in addition to interviewing soldiers and officers, I've also been uh, participating in quite a lot of encounters between the rape survivors and outsiders coming from Europe, etc., in the Congo. And it's always the same dynamic, that the woman shortly mentions uh, the rape and then goes on to talk about her real problems that she experiences, often connected to the pillage, that she has nothing to, to, to live on anymore, the, the kids are sick, etc. These questions, the poverty questions related to the other violence that she's been exposed to, maybe her husband was killed, etc. But it's always the same uh, dynamics in the sense that the, the one coming from the outside does not hear the other part of the story. And I think it's partly because the outside coming there is coming in order to hear about the rape. They're not coming to hear about poverty. I mean, it's not as in interesting and fascinating. But it's also related to this idea that rape is always the most difficult or traumatic uh, 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 kind of violence that can, can, uh, can uh, be to women. So I think that we have a responsibility also for that reason to, to, to see it in the context and really listen to what the women in these conflict contexts are telling us. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, uh, you know, sir, we, we, we're not aware of any place in West Africa, maybe so, you know, in Africa where crimes committed during war are being documented. For our sake today, for the sake of people coming after us, I think this is very necessary because it can help as a guide. It can help as a research center. If, if anybody has been to Liberia, you, you know that it's very difficult. If you need certain documents, you want to go do some research, it's almost non-existent. So we're trying to establish that and also in the hope that we will be able to uh, thwart prosecution, we believe in the context of Liberia that definitely is going to be very helpful. It's going to be very preventive. I mean, preventive. And we also think that um, I think governments in the West, it is about time, time they, they included uh, time aids, you know, uh, financial assistance to countries, third world countries where some of these things occur to investigating, in aggressively investigating rape cases and showing concrete proofs and evidence that we have, we have prosecuted three, four, five, six, six rape cases, or else gonna be deja vu all over again. A man's word, they do whatever they want, and that's what's happening around. And in conclusion, I think, um, one thing I told a friend last night about documentation of these crimes, and that is, it helps even five years from now, a, public, a victim sees the perpetrator, say, in the Netherlands, and he knows that he spoke with uh, researchers at the just the research center in Monrovia, and he contacts us, or she contacts us, we know where the person is, he goes to the Dutch prosecutor, and we can make him pay for his crimes. We think it's necessary not to allow those crimes just to go to forget them. Now, two, two of these, two of these uh, testimonies I brought, I was now going through them. These are testimonies of two women who were raped and who have been identified as HIV positive. Now, can't do more than that. Their lives destroyed. And the, the, the people allegedly accused are having good time, fine time, running around Western Europe and you know, North America. be very brief and at the risk of repeating myself, I think um, one of the most important frontiers in this research is really speaking directly to perpetrators. Um, and I think that's particularly important to try to unpack this idea of what it means for rape to be a strategy of war, a tactic of war, a tool of war. One of the best ways that we can understand that is by speaking directly to members of the armed groups that seem to be using 
rape in this way and asking them directly, what, what did rape mean for your group? How did you know who to target? Were you ordered to target? Um, if you were not ordered to target a particular set of victims, how did people in your, in your group know which set of victims were appropriate and which weren't? Um, to try to really get at the group level dynamics of what's happening in the context of these groups. I think we need to kind of move beyond just simply saying rape is used as a strategy or as a target in particular contexts and really drill down to understand um, what that means for the fighters on the ground. And I think that has very important implications for um, potential policy interventions and, and also for the research on, on causes of war, or causes of, causes of war, causes of rape during wartime. I um, couldn't agree more with that. Uh, I guess also, <laughs> right, also for me, I think that we, most of the research done on the causes of war rape, most of the jurisprudence about war rape, most of our understandings, media presentations, and scholarly presentations of war rape are done assuming men as men are the perpetrators and women as women are the victims. That's a partial story, and it's not just a partial story because it actually covers men as perpetrators and women as victims. Our argument is that it therefore tells a partial story of war rape generally, that is, even of men's motivations and women's victimization. And so to me, the question is how do you, as a policy suggestion, which policy people will laugh at me about, how do you deconstruct gender stereotypes to make us understand more holistically those questions, but also the way that gender focuses a motivation for and a narrative, a motivation for committing the crime and a narrative for victimization of it. So I guess to me, I think that this question of deconstructing gender stereotypes not only actually gets at war rape, but gets at other sexual crimes in war and also other sexualized tactics and strategies of war. To make it very short, um, we need evidence-based treatment for victims and for perpetrators. We have to listen and we have to break the silence if we want to break the cycle of violence. So treatment is not a luxury, treatment is a must. Two things. I think uh, adding to Dara's call for research with perpetrators, I would add we need to talk with and understand the logic of individuals and groups that don't engage in rape despite the opportunities to do so. And second, I think this is maybe building on Maria's work, uh, some of her other work. I think often we in our research, our policy advocacy, our legal work, uh, we reduce the life story of a victim of sexual violence to that victimization. And I think, I suspect, uh, given my own work, that uh, using oral histories, that part of the power of the kind of therapy you're engaging in is recontextualizing that event in a much longer history and some of the work that's been done on truth commissions points to the way in which women's or male victims of sexual violence, their own story is a long story of heroic activism in a political struggle, or it might be a story of my brother, uncle, cousin, husband was detained, I went to that base and I basically traded myself in he was released and I stayed there for a week. That's a story of heroism in the midst of war and I think part of uh, contextualizing um, sexual violence is also restoring the agency to civilians and the way in which they try and succeed in varying degrees given what they're going through to make sense of the limited choices that they have. All right, thank you to our panelists. Thank you everybody for this. Okay. And uh, we'll see you back in here around 11 o'clock. Thanks so much to this panel. Fabulous job. <laughs>